You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Hey, everyone. Thank you very much for hitting that play button. Uh, No matter where you are, listening to the car or listening on your way to work or riding a bike or whatever you're doing when you're listening to this. Thank you so much. Uh, This is another episode of the Dave Willis Podcast. Before I get to today's episode, I just want to say one quick thing. Uh, We are actually entered into the podcast awards. So if you go to the show notes at DaveBullis.com, there is actually a link that takes you right to the podcast awards. We are in two categories, the People's Choice Awards and the Education category. I know education is kind of an odd category for us to be in, but um, hey, you know what? It it really is is like a film school. Like I always say, it's like a free film school. Uh, We have a different teacher every week, so I guess it it really is education. So if you can, please vote for us in the education category and the People's Choice Awards category. Again, the link is at DaveBullis.com. It's 100% free to sign up. And also, by the way, thank you to everybody for uh, the, the feedback. I was actually tweeting out a link on uh, about a free camera uh, competition, and I actually, you know, shared it on social media, and I actually shared it in my email list, and I had about four people who unsubscribed, and I don't get it, I don't understand it, because if you subscribe to, to my email list, you want to hear about filmmaking, at least that's what I think, and they unsubscribed when I was literally pointing towards a free camera giveaway. Uh, I don't get it sometimes, I really just don't get it. But I digress. On this episode of the Dave Bullis Podcast... We're going to talk to a guy I've been meaning to talk to for a very long time. He and I have actually have bumped into each other many a times, uh, whether it be at a wrestling show while he's a wrestler and I was in the audience when I was in wrestling all those years ago, uh, or even on social media where we just keep bumping back and forth into each other. This man has wrestled all over the globe. He has wrestled some of the biggest legends in wrestling, and he has since retired and become a full-time filmmaker. And we're going to talk about all of that And we're also going to talk about his new film, The Trade. All that good stuff on this episode. This is episode 169 with guest Matthew T. Burns. You're listening to the Dave Bullis Podcast. So you and I have actually met before, and I don't think you probably remember, but it was at a CZW event, and I actually, one time, uh, not only did I hand you a chair um, during a match, uh, I, I forget who you were wrestling, I just remember handing you this chair, uh, but we actually talked afterwards, after the show, and then Madman Pondo came up to talk to both of us. Oh man, I I had no idea, I mean, you you and I have talked do you remember the instance in which you handed me the chair? I'm trying to, I wonder if I'll recall this. Like, can you remember anything about that? Yeah, uh, you were leaning over the rope, you were in the ring and you called for a chair and I, and I held, I picked it up and I gave it to you. It was already folded out. Like it wasn't folded it, uh, like up. It was, um, it was, it wasn't collapsed. So I handed it up and you were in the main event. It was at champ soccer arena in Seoul, New Jersey. Um, and I can't remember who you were wrestling. I want to say maybe Rick blade. Um, <laughs> that's funny to hear that, man. I, I I can't quite remember that either. Hey, man, we've got a history. Yeah, yeah. It's just it's a small world, but and that's why uh, <laughs> I was I, when I when I saw you were in film, I was like, you know what? It's a, it's a it's a perfect chance to to catch up and and uh, just talk about that. But that's that was just that story I wanted to save because I was like, man, I I just remember giving you that chair, and it was funny too because I actually went with my manager, um, at, who who was my manager at at a video game store I was working at. And he went with me because he was like so excited to see CCW. And he was like, Oh, I hope I won't see anything that's going to like make me get sick or anything. And I'm like, <laughs> No, I guess that's subjective. But, uh, but I was like, I don't, I don't think you will. And, um, he ended up loving it. And, uh, after that though, he never, he, he just like his, he, he just really was one of those guys that he liked the show, but he just, his, his love affair of wrestling was starting to sort of fade away. Um, and, and I, I kind of understand that because my love of wrestling started to fade, fade away around like 2004, 2005. And then I just mm-hmm. kind of stopped watching altogether. 
I mean, I mean, you know, I, I know you retired in 2003. You know, I'm sorry, I'm getting way ahead of this interview. I'm just like, I'm just going all over the place here. Well, uh, that, that this just confirms we we got to talk, man. We I you you mentioned that around 2004, 2005 is when you kind of uh, drifted away from wrestling, and I retired in 2003, and so I. I had watched wrestling for a couple of years and just tracked with everything that was going on, but I came to realize like it, it kind of needs to be all in or all out for me because I don't always want to feel pulled or tempted, you know, pulled, pulled back toward the ring. But, um, so it's just interesting. It seems like you kind of veered away from wrestling the same time that I did and maybe started really pursuing film just like I did. Yeah, that, that was uh right around the time that I, you know what it was, honestly, Matt was, it was a combination of all the independent promotions I liked, like ECW had folded, uh, which was like 2001. Um, you know, a lot of the other independents I was watching, a lot of my other friends weren't into it. The only thing that was keeping my interest in wrestling was legitimately CZW and Big Japan. If it wasn't for those two promotions, I would have just stopped altogether because WWE was awful at that point. And I, I was like, you know, I, I just don't really want to do this. You know, I, I just don't want to follow this anymore. And it's funny enough because right around that time was when I actually started training to become a pro wrestler. And um, then I, I, after that, I just really, after I got done training as a pro wrestler, I really just stopped. That was the end for me. Who did you train with? I didn't know that. I didn't know you did that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, see that I, I saved all this, uh, Matt, I saved all this because I want to, I wanted to actually uh, uh, talk about this on the, the podcast. So I trained with a couple of different people. Uh, my main training came with King Kong Bundy. Do you remember him? Yeah, I was, I was on a couple of shows with him. I remember, uh, I, I had a girlfriend who was a wrestler and she brought a big batch of cookies for everybody. This is, this is my King Kong Bundy memory, but it, all of a sudden it's just like, where did all the cookies go? And you realize like he literally ate all of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny because I actually, we had to go me and this, my best friend at the time, I'm both training to be a wrestler at his school. And we had to go pick him up one time to go to practice, right? So we pick him up at his house in Jersey, and uh, we, we knock on the door, and, and Bundy's like, come on in, boys, come on in. And, you know, he's sitting there in this big Burka lounger recliner type deal at eating a half gallon of ice cream, watching Hunter. He's nowhere near ready, and we're like, you know, King, like we got to get training in like, you know, I don't know, half an hour or so. And he goes, he goes, the, don't worry, they won't start without me. <laughs> <laughs> this is just his way of dealing with the indies, I suppose. After you know, bigger stages and just how to how he's coping with the indies. <laughs> <laughs> At least with Bundy, at least he 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 was a lovable guy. Like I mean, my you know what you want to tell you what my uh, uh, Matt you know what my favorite Bundy story is, and this has almost nothing to do with Bundy, was the fact that there was a Chinese restaurant right from <laughs> right down from where we trained, and he one day he orders a bunch of food, and he says, "You guys come deliver it to me." He ask for King Kong Bundy, so. We were in the ring working out, right? And the delivery guy comes through, in, you know, through the front door, and he comes to the, to the ring, and he goes, "I have a delivery here for a ping pong rundy," and everybody <laughs> starts dying. <laughs> and and uh, and Bundy comes out of his office. He goes, "That's me," and and he goes, and then we all started calling him ping pong after that. And he goes. <laughs> <laughs> he was so angry about that, and he's like, he's like, he's like, the next guy who calls me ping pong is going to be out in the street. Uh, but, it, <laughs> but uh, Bundy was such a cool guy sometimes, and it was. I, I, I know I'm going off on King Kong Bundy here, but I'll, I'll tell you this one another funny Bundy story because you get this because you're you know you grew up watching him and you you're obviously you were a professional wrestler. Um, yeah. one time Bundy splat, it was on an indie, on an indie show and he splashed the guy and the referee goes one, two, three. And Bundy goes five. And the ref goes one, two, three. And Bundy at this family friendly indie show yells out, you piece of shit. And he shoves <laughs> the ref and the promoter was like, uh, Hey Chris, he goes, uh, this is a family friendly show. And you just yell shit in the middle of the ring in front of kids. He goes, he goes, I'm sorry. He goes, I wanted that five count. And he started counting over from one. <laughs> oh man. I, I'm so glad you have some, uh, 
some indie wrestling memories and stories, even though your your tenure was kind of brief. I mean, those moments they they tend to happen when you, when you hang around any of the, the the former stars or the whole indie wrestling scene. So that is classic. Yeah, it was. I, I was very fortunate, uh, Matt. To, to I mean, because I was in I was involved with pro wrestling for like this little teeny tiny window, and I was just fortunate enough to to be in the right place at the right time. Um, and just sort of, you know, do my thing. And actually, it was funny enough, I actually applied, uh, because I started talking to Zandig about going to CCW school back when it was, like, run by, like, John Dahmer and Eddie Valentine and those guys. Mm -hmm. And I never actually went to a practice, um, but I was talking to Zandig about showing up, and then I ended up trying to go to uh, ECWA school, which was run by Mozart Fontaine. Um, mm-hmm. And then, then I started, then I went to Bundy school, but you know, what? En- enough about me, Matt, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm like monopolizing this conversation. I'm so sorry. Um, so I want to talk about you. I want to talk about, you know, your, your whole career and everything. So when, you know, you started off in professional wrestling. Now, what, what drew you to actually get into professional wrestling? It was same as, same as you ECW. I was, um, that was a promotion that of course came up out of the underground on um, East coast United States and had a little bit more edge to it, had a little bit more risk taking, had a little, little bit more uh, colorful characters and crowd involvement. And it was extreme. And so that was, that was what got me into it as a teenager and what ultimately um, motivated me and inspired me to pursue it. Um, once I hit my late teens. So, and you grew up in Minnesota, correct? I was born in Minnesota, um, but I grew up in Pennsylvania. So, um, so I was right there when, when ECW was, you know, in, in, uh, in Pennsylvania and New Jersey and Delaware and New York. And so I had to hit up, uh, several of those shows a month. I, I was going all the time with my friends. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, so you were like really, really close to me because I, you know, I'm from Philly. So I'm actually, I, you know, I went to a lot of those shows as well. So what was your favorite, one of your favorite ECW moments actually going to those shows? The first time I ever went to an ECW show, I, I was 15, and this kid that I knew from school, his name was Phil, uh, he said to me, do you want to go to this pro wrestling show? And I was like, uh, I don't know. And uh, he's like, you can bring weapons. And I said, what? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, he's he's like, yeah, you bring weapons. I'm like, what do you mean weapons? And he's like, oh, just stuff in your house that, you know, you wanted the wrestlers to hit each other with. And I, I didn't know what he was talking about. But yeah, but bring some cookie sheets or whatever. And I did. And this, like I said, it was 1995. This was before the Athletic Commission really got involved. But every show, um, not all the wrestlers, but a, a good number of them would brawl through the crowd, just reach out, whatever you hand them, smack the guy with it, give it back to you. It was very interactive, and oftentimes you get something handed back to you with blood on it, and I couldn't believe this. I just could, could, couldn't fathom. So that was what hooked me initially, but, you know, Paul Heyman with his booking, he, he was also sure to get some real athleticism and very, very talented, um, uh, you know, athletes on, on the shows as well, and so it was just a very polished and well-rounded product, but that, that was what really caught my attention as a teenager. Yeah, and I, I know what you mean because it was just so different. It had such an edge to it, which you know, it, which is indicative because it was like that that sort of backlash. Because I mean, you remember wrestling in like the early '90s to mid '90s. They had like characters like uh, like Duke the Dumpster Drosy and uh, Bastion Booger and all those characters, and they were just so cartoony. And then in WCW, you had like the Dungeon of Doom and 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 you know what was going on there. And then all of a sudden, ECW comes, and it's a completely different product. It's a lot edgier, a lot more in-your-face, a lot more hardcore. And, I mean, you know, you just saw it, and you're like, what the hell is this, you know? Uh, you know, and uh, some people once told me that, and this really was what really I remember most about, you know, how, how they branded themselves, and it was WF is fake, WCW is fake, but this right here is real. I can yeah I can literally remember at one point I was wearing like five ECW shirts um, a week at school in high school each day I'd wear a different one I was I was really a fanatic for a while and I remember giving school presentations you you could talk about whatever you wanted and I gave a presentation on how this wrestling was real and at one point there was some heat between uh, Cactus Jack and Sandman. And I kid you not, I was at a show, I think it was in Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, 
but um, it was sort of like a battle royal. A new wrestler comes to the ring every, I don't know, two minutes or something like that, and Sandman comes out with a fresh Singapore cane, which is like strands of uh, bamboo, you know, tied together, swings it, hits Mick Foley, uh, Cactus Jack, on the side of the face, the cheekbone, and shatters the cane. I'm not kidding. He swung it like a baseball bat. And pieces flew in the crowd, and, and I picked up a piece of this cane, and I, this is one of the things I brought into school just to try and convince people that this is real, real wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like it's like hey look look at this teacher it's 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 a piece of cane that that got some guy named Cactus Jack kind of busted over his head and it's just it, I, did the teacher like freak out and be like what the hell? It's funny because I think what spurred this on was the teacher um, I don't know overheard me talking about um, this wrestling and how it's real and she's like no it's all just effects and they don't really get hurt and the blood is fake. And I remember also bringing in a cookie sheet that had blood, just like crusty blood drip, dripped all the way down it. But I, I remember telling the story, and the teacher was just... Uh, hey, Matt, are you still there? Uh, so if you could hear me, um, we were going good, and all of a sudden you cut out, and there's like this whistling. Oh, now it's gone. Uh, it's it's back now. There's like this whistling I can hear. I don't know what that is. Uh, um, it's kind of an open area. I passed through a valley, but uh, let me know. Has, is the whistling still there? No, it's gone now. I don't know what that was. It was weird. Uh, but I'm sorry. Um. So could you take it right from where you had you said about the crusty blood coming down the uh, cookie sheet? Yeah. So I think I think what uh, caused the what motivated this presentation was a teacher overhearing me talking about the wrestling being real and saying that's not real. That's you know it, they're they're stunt men and the blood is fake. And so I brought in this piece of uh, Singapore cane. I remember bringing in a, a cookie sheet that had crusty blood on it, and that kind of silenced the teacher. Um, but half the students in the class are just looking at me like, what's with this dude? Like, why does he even want to talk about this stuff? But it, it, I was riveted as a teenager. So, yeah, you know, I, I was the same as you, uh, Matt, when I was in high school because I had all the wrestling T-shirts and stuff. And I remember one time I wore a Yoshihiro Tajiri T-shirt, and it was all in Japanese. And a friend of mine was like, what the hell is this? He goes, you're wearing, now you're not even wearing shirts in English anymore. He's like, it's all in Japanese. He's like, he's like, I don't even know if this guy's even a wrestler or whatever. Um, and then, I mean, I know you did this as well, but you got involved in backyard wrestling. Um, I did, I did that as well. And it went from this, like my league that I had, we, we, we were like, you know, it was a fun little thing. Then all of a sudden it started getting more and more like violence to the point where, our final, uh, our final time that we had a, 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 a an event, if you want to call it an event, uh, what happened was the neighbors up at the top of this hill could see down onto us, and they actually called the cops on us because they were like, "Oh, look, these kids are having a brawl down there," and it was so weird how it happened because it's like one bike cop shows up first, right? One lone bike cop, and he goes, "Hey guys, what's going on?" And we're just like, because we were all just standing there. And we're like, hey, dude, you know, like, you know, we were just, it wasn't like a confrontation. It was like a friendly conversation of like a bike cop randomly coming to my friend's backyard. And he pulled, because he had a driveway that all, all the way down. It was really weird how we had this set up. So the bike cop just went down, used that. And he's like, well, he goes, we got a report that there's like a, a brawl or a mob brawl or something going on. I'm like, well, not here. Well, all of a sudden, all these other cars started come, like police cars started coming down. And they're like, oh my God, are you guys, or what are you guys doing back here? Blah, blah, blah. Well, all of a sudden, my friend's mom comes out of their, her ha their house and she's drunk as shit. And she's trying to, like, what are they doing out here now? And I mean, it was like the it was like the worst case scenario that could have happened. And, and it's just like afterwards, the friends and I were like, I don't think we should do this anymore. And 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 everyone everyone kind of agreed because he, the guy the guy obviously we didn't get in, like in trouble or anything. But we're like, you know, if something were going on, it would have been like terrible. But I know you you also did backyard wrestling too, right? Right, right, Matt. Yeah, and. It's funny hearing you say that. I it, it just dawned on me. I I think number one, 
we would have been pretty good friends had we grown up together. And two, we might have led to uh, some some I don't know if I'd say jail time, but some trouble with the law as well. Because like, whenever I had somebody just throw gas on the on the fire with me, like we ended up getting in trouble, and that probably would have been the case. But but uh, yeah, we we dabbled in the backyard as well. This this was before that whole movement. But we would we would just call it ninja battles. We'd play music, store up a bunch of weapons, and it was just unscripted chaos. It was funny. Sometimes people got hurt. It was exciting. But yeah, we we did this, you know, at least once a month, sometimes a couple times a month, and would end up limping around school with bruises and little cuts and stuff. But yeah, that was that was a big part of my my teenage years as well. Yeah, yeah, we, we would have been good friends, uh, uh, Matt, and we probably would have, we probably would have done jail time together because um, you and I are, are are kind of close in age. I'm 32, um, and and I know we're, we're so we're kind of close in age, and it would have been kind of funny to go to school together. I, you know, it, but because uh, again, you're you were right, probably right up the street from me because I'm right here in in, in, uh, in Philly, so you're probably right. You're probably growing up right down the street from me. I didn't, I didn't even know it because uh, we've had all these like you know cut meetings and stuff like that, but. Uh, so you know, as you as you went, you know, got into and did all this backyard wrestling, you know, a, AKA ninja battles. You know, at what point, you know, did you want to go professional with this? This was around the end of high school. Um, I had, I I was naturally um, gifted when it came to art. That was something I just gravitated towards, and and everybody assumed I was going to go to art school. I was going to pursue it. Um, but I had a real bad time with some of my teachers in high school and, um, especially my senior year. And at the same time, we had a growing interest in this wrestling stuff. And, um, so with, with some really frustrating things with teachers and getting in trouble my senior year, which was when I was trying to clean up my act, but I had some unfortunate things, um, happen. It, I, I've told this story before, but essentially I designed our school's yearbook cover and I made a really elaborate design put some um symbols on it that were inspired by Greek mythology and and uh, I can't remember what else but they printed the yearbooks passed them out last minute I get accused of putting satanic symbols on the yearbook cover it was a huge deal they weren't going to let me graduate they hired a special investigator to look into this um he got back and he said if anything these are more gang related, not satanic, but he said, this is nothing to worry about. I was cleared of all charges, but like, I was so upset over this incident and other bad experiences with um, some art teachers in high school that I, I just said, screw it. I'm going to wrestling school. Um, so yeah, that was my senior year. It was just a growing interest in ECW. And I had finally started putting some muscle on working out. And then I just said, you know what? I think I could do this. This is what I'm going to do. I knew it was going to be short term, but uh, it was, I figured I'd take a break and shake off all the school drama for a while and just do something really wild. Yeah. And, and honestly, uh, I, I think you dodged a bullet not going to art school. Uh, I honestly, you know, listeners of this podcast know, man, I, I am against college and I know everybody immediately, as soon as I say something like that, everyone goes, what, you know, but, but I am, man, I, I've, I've, I, you know, I, I have a college education, I graduated from college. I have a huge student loan debt. Uh, that degree has helped me not one iota. And also, I worked at the college I graduated from. That was a terrible experience. And, uh, and I can tell you, man. You know, but but it's just it's just funny you mentioned. You know, just going back when you were talking about they had a special investigator come in. You know, schools. It's it's unbelievable when schools want to spend money on something stupid. They will always find thousands of dollars to spend money on like an investigator to investigate stuff like this. But yet when, when, when people are actually asking for money for like real things, they're like, Oh, sorry, we have nothing to spend. I can, I can remember looking the principal in the eyes and I said, you listen to me. I said, not only am I going to graduate, I'm not going to serve one bit of punishment or anything for this. I said, mark my words. Principal didn't know what to say, but, Fortunately, it ended up being being uh, right. My my dad was out of the state or out of the country. I can't remember at the time. He might have been visiting my sister in Spain. She was going to college there. But my dad called the school as well, and he said, "You guys are fortunate. I'm not there right now. If you're going to do this to my son, 
And uh, it was just so absurd, like accusing me of being a Satan worshiper and trying to put these symbols on the yearbook cover. So it was a small town I grew up in. It was uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I, I was in Elkins Park for a while, uh, very close to you, but um, then I was in Lancaster with, you know, small country, small town um, environment. So, you know, people get freaked out over that sort of thing, and it's, it's a witch hunt. And so, unfortunately, I, I went through that. But, yeah, that was that was rough. Yeah, Lancaster is, you know, probably about 45 minutes, 50 minutes away from me. And, uh, you, you know, I, I, I know the small town you're talking about, uh, you know, because I, I actually had a friend of mine. We actually shot a movie in Birdsbo- Birdsboro, uh, which I'm sure, mm-hmm. do, do you know where that is? Yes, I, I've heard of Birdsboro, yes. Okay, so you, we actually shot a movie there. And um, it was just funny because when he said that town name, I'm like, "What the hell is what the hell is Birdsboro?" Like it was just this little like burg, and it's just I've been up there, so I know you know that 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 mentality. You know what I mean? Like he's trying to you know he's trying to trying to you know uh, you know poison the mind with these sant- with these satanic symbols. You know what I mean? It's um, but but you know when when you when you were talking about going to college and you know and you had a choice between going to college or wrestling school, I, I honestly you know Matt, I think you did the right right thing. Um, not only because we're talking, have this conversation, obviously, but uh, with you know the decisions you made, but also because I honestly, most people I know that go to college just aren't happy at all. You know, I agree with you, and I have heard um, your previous podcasts, and I know your stance on this. And I'll say that I believe self motivation plays such a big part of how well your college experience does or doesn't go, because I can tell you. I didn't get all the film education I needed in college, but I had a tight knit group of friends that we just worked so hard on each other's shoots. And that was where we learned the most. And so as far as what college did for me, it's just the schedule, the discipline, having deadlines, and then learning how to work with people and, you know, having projects that have to be turned in. So the routine. So I I will say, yes, you can do all of that on your own but you have to be very motivated and, you know, you can't say, Oh, well, my job got in the way. I can't go to college. You can't say, Oh, my, my kids or my whatever, you know, are distracting me. It's like, you have these deadlines you have to hit, but I, I know exactly what you need. If if you're not self-motivated, you're not going to learn what you need to learn. Yeah. And it's, you know, just with college in in general, what what I've you know noticed just when working at a college, uh, actually at several colleges, and also at a, at attending a college, is you know a lot of the kids who go there are always told you have to go to college if you want a good job, and I see a lot of the people that go to to certain colleges, they're they're just not there to to learn and to get better. They feel like it's just something where they have to do to get that degree, and it's like let's just get, let's get this over as quick as possible. And I think that's just bad as well because it's just like it shouldn't be something where you're like, all right, I got to do this if I want if I got to you know go out and get this degree and whatever. I mean, half of the, the where I worked at mainly where I worked at was like one of those discounted college that you always hear about. You know what I mean? Where it's just pure fluff. There's you know nobody ever knows what's going on. That was literally every. Every trope, every stereotype you could think of in, in, of college was this college. It was just a, a small little college uh, right outside of, of Philly. And it just, you know, they, they, there was like really nothing going on there. And half the kids there, or even more than half the kids, had like no plan. It was just like, we're here, uh, you know, we're just to sort of pass the time or whatever. You know what I mean? And I, I, as we sort of talk about it, like education in general... You know, you, you and I are big movie fans, and you really don't mm-hmm. need to go to college to take a lot of mo- admit, to to learn about a, to learn about movies or even you know go to film school or whatever because that's a big topic, obviously, on this podcast. Is, is if film school is even worth it? And you know, now, you know, if you and if you or I, even nowadays, wanted to to gain more knowledge of film, we could get a Netflix rental. I could go out right now and buy a camera package. And it would be cheaper, all of that, and I could even add a lot more stuff to it, then then it would be cheaper than even one semester of college. It's absolutely true. Um, And I feel like, you know, we went through the the season of, oh boy, like, here come the movies, like everybody can make a movie, but I actually feel like it's slowly going to rebound where quality is going to be necessary because it is so easy to make a movie, or at least compared to what it, it used to be. But I, I'm actually, that's kind of a different topic, but like I'm hoping 
um, the industry is going to go in that direction. I mean, the mainstream things are always going to be a formula that, you know, they know that the masses want to see, but I'm just saying because it's getting so easy and you can really educate yourself and, you know, create the product on your own. Like I'm, I'm hoping that, um, and I believe I'm starting to see it. Like you, you have to be really, really sharp at your craft if you're going to, if you're going to cut through all that, you know? Yeah. And, and that, that's another thing that, you know, we, we talk a lot about this on the podcast is that, that allure that everybody can make a movie. And it, honestly, hand to God, it is true. Everybody can make a movie, you know, cause we have our phones, we have camera packages that are getting cheaper and cheaper. The, the difference is about making a quality movie. And I, I have been on bad film sets. I've been on really good film sets and I can, you know, and also I can see what the, the end product is going to be. Excuse me. And I, I, I um, and I can see, you know, as we sort of go through all, the, you know, through all these different phases of, of what we're doing, going with through now with film and distribution and marketing and, and all the new wonderful advancements in cameras, you kind of start looking around and you go, wow, you know, people are, are, are I had Sean uh, Baker on here. Uh, who who shot uh, uh, Tangerine on his iPhone, and it, and it was uh, you know I think it won Sundance. Uh, you know I, I had uh, uh, on somebody else who who shot their film uh, with a GoPro, and it, you know it, it's it's about how the, I mean obviously there's a lot more to it than what I'm saying. I, it's, <laughs> so if anyone's listening to this and think it's just you know picking up a phone and you know going out and filming, and that's not what they did. Uh, they did a lot more to it, but I think you're absolutely right, Matt. I think honestly it's going to bounce back sooner than later, and I think it, it's. Because I think a lot of people are just going to make one movie and maybe sort of go away from it. You know what I mean? They're going to say, hey, listen, I made my movie uh, in my backyard with my friends. And, you know, maybe they didn't like, they didn't like the experience. And that was sort of it for them. And then, the, and then you know, they're, they're going to have to realize because the quality that people are used to is going to, always going to be there. And especially now with YouTube and Hulu and or not, not, not Hulu, uh, Vimeo. You see, like, people, like, like independent filmmakers and, with, and the quality that they can do. And it's just, you know, it does raise the bar for, you know, what an indie standard is. You're exactly right. And the two main questions are always going to be there. Who's in it and what's it about? You know, if you're sitting in the room and somebody says, oh, hey, this movie is, is coming out this weekend. You know, who's in it? Oh, it's Tom Cruise. What's it about? He's he's trying to stop this bomb that's, that's going to blow up the Parliament building in London or whatever, you know. Um, but those questions, especially the what's it about, you have to have a really sharp hook and a really sharp idea and notion. And I still think it's tough to sell a really good film without a star in it if you don't have the star in it. And so I think they're going to be weeding through, you know, the top talent. And so um, because so many people are going to be coming at them with offers and with films uh, nowadays, it's going to have to, it's going to have to be a rock solid concept. And so, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic that it, that, like I say, it's, it's going to start to weed out the, um, it's great that people are making films with their iPhones and their GoPros, but you know, that's not going to work 99 times out of a hundred. You know what I mean? It's like, you're going to have to be very, very sharp at your skill if you're going to pull that off. Yeah. And, and you know what, what I found to be most true about all of this too is, you know, when Netflix first started, I actually, rem- I was actually, you know, a pretty early subscriber to Netflix and you know what's funny was that they used to let you submit your films to Netflix directly. Like, it wasn't a whole process. Like, there was literally a tab that said, submit your film to Netflix. I actually had friends who got their movies onto Netflix with, like, absolute dreck. And they knew it was dreck. And they were like, you know, they were telling me, like, hey, Netflix accepted my movie. And I was said, what? Really? And I said, wow. And then, I, you know, it was basically like a kind of like an offshoot at YouTube at that point then. I, well, my perception of it, because I, I kept I was like, wow, this this was like something with a mini DV cam. Nowadays, it's like oh, that obviously is long gone. And now, they, you know, you have to have certain even um, uh, deliverable requirements to even get on Netflix, even for, you know what I mean? Because they, they, they actually have. Uh, uh, the the minimum requirements listed on their website that say though know, this is what you're going to have to have if you ever want to see your movie on our on our website, and which kind of you sort of brings me uh, what I want to talk about with you is you know you you got into filmmaking so you know and and uh, you know we're talking about the film education so when you were still pro wrestling you you actually you had a job at Blockbuster at some point right yeah and my my uh, first two years into film school, I was still wrestling on the weekends and 
keeping that a secret. Um, for those that don't know, I was involved in some very violent wrestling, uh, beyond hardcore wrestling, ultra violent wrestling is what they were calling it at the time. And which would leave me bruised, limping, oftentimes with stitches. Um, and I wasn't telling anybody about this in art school. I was trying to hide it. And so I used to say it, it was always like the movie fight club. I'm, I'm just trying to make up a, an excuse of what happened to me and live in this double life. Um, but anybody who's gone to college full time and anybody who thinks going to art school is easy, you know, like it's not real college, man, is it ever hard work, everything that they dump on you. And so those first two years were very, very hard. Um, you know, flying out on the weekends, getting banged up, bruised up, cut up, and then coming back and trying to maintain a full schedule at college. So, so yeah, I was, I was juggling both for a while. Yeah, you know, because I, I I remember, uh, I forget when it was, but I saw a photo of you, uh, you know, doing your your trademark um, uh, hand gesture, and you you were with the blockbuster shirt on, and I remember saying, oh, Mon-, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, your, your wrestling name, Sick Nick Mondo. I, re- I remember saying to myself, oh, Mondo works at Blockbuster. That's freaking cool, uh, you know, because I, I I imagine you know now as we're talking, you, you must have been able to get a lot of free rentals to get like a really cool uh, you know film school, you know, right at your fingertips by actually watching movies, kind of like what Quentin Tarantino did. I I really enjoyed working at Blockbuster for a long time. And um, like they'd have the employee recommendation wall and nobody cared about it, but I really did. And um, I'd update it and just chat with customers. And we were a smaller store, but my sales numbers were matching anybody like in the bigger district stores. Um, I'd, I'd sell the rewards programs and whatever else. Because if, I, if I believe in something, I can sell it, you know, but I, it was really fun for a while, you know, for a few years working there, but I did have a couple of times, uh, like I said, I wasn't telling people I was wrestling. And one time I was working and the, the manager was there and somebody came in and, and, and he sees me and he's like, yo, he's like sick Nick Mondo. And I just kind of froze and I was just like, hi. And he's like, yeah, I saw you wrestle in the West St. Paul Armory or something, so on and so forth. And I noticed my manager's kind of watching like, what? <laughs> and then he came over afterwards and he's like, so what was that about? And reluctantly, I told him, but then I, you know what I did? I walked over. We had a, a, a video game you could rent. It was Backyard Wrestling 2. Uh, there Goes the Neighborhood. That's, that's what the game was called. And I was, I was in that game, and I was actually on the back cover of it because he didn't believe me that I was a wrestler. And I was like, yeah, that's something I did for a while. I, I had just quit at the time, actually, but, but uh, it's just a weird class. I was, I was friends with... Uh, Ken Kennedy and he was living in Minnesota and so was I. And just one time randomly, he brought Matt Hardy into the store to meet me. I'm working and uh, just Ken walked, you know, brought him in and I, I burst out laughing. I didn't mean to when I saw Matt, because it's just like the funniest thing. Like I didn't expect Matt Hardy to come in, but yeah, then we chatted for a while and, and that was really cool. And uh, then I got to see them wrestle at the target center um, a couple of days later or day later or something like that. But, but yeah, weird, weird mix of worlds for sure. So, so Matt, can I just ask: Is Ken Kennedy a good guy in person? Man, I, I got along with him instantly, and um, yeah, we were both living in Minnesota, and um, I, I, I know there's some heat in WWE, some some clashes of people. I don't even know the full story that unfortunately led to him not going um, as far as a lot of people expected him to there, but I don't quite know what happened but i'll just say like i we loved that guy we brought him on to some film projects and my friends everybody just was so entertained by him and, and uh i i always enjoyed being around ken really really did you, you know uh i know i'm, I'm sorry to, to sort of go on a side topic here man i, I had a funny little ken kennedy story i i was remember when he was in that movie behind enemy lines for columbia yep well, I actually, yeah. I, he was going to be in Philly for a signing. So I said, you know what, to my friend, I said, you know what, let's go down there. I want to meet him. Just for shits and giggles. And we both like, you know, we both, uh, uh, we both like movies, he, me and this friend of mine. And we both, uh, at the time, were kind of iffy about wrestling, but we knew who he was. So I said, you know what, let's just go down there. We walk in, and this woman is standing there and saying that we both need to buy a copy of the movie for us to meet him. So I said, okay. I said, all right, then. So I go to pick up a copy of the movie, and it's retail. 
they didn't even have it on sale. It was like $35 or whatever for this Blu-ray. And I said, are you serious? You're really going to charge us and not even like discount this thing? And she goes, you get to go up there and meet Ken Kennedy and blah, 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 this and that. And my friend actually refused to do it. And it ended up where we where uh, he refused to buy a copy of the movie. And then that, then this woman was basically just goading us into a fight. And it was just like finally we just left, and we're like, oh well. But we never, but it, we never got to meet Ken Kennedy whatsoever. And it was just kind of weird that we went all the way up there, and we ended up just getting turned away because like we wouldn't buy this movie at like a full retail price. And uh, and we, and my friend obviously was just had a big problem about it. But it was just I don't know. I, I just always think about that every time somebody mentions Ken Kennedy. That's the first thing that comes to my mind. What a what a disappointing experience. I I would imagine if Ken knew about that, he wouldn't have had that at all. I mean, I used to I used to be on indie wrestling shows with him and he was nothing but he was he was a loud mouth and he was a heel, but he'd always take time for pictures and signings and everything. So that's yeah, that's unfortunate, man. Uh, that that's so good to know, and, and hopefully maybe one day I can have Ken on the show because he does uh, he does do acting, he does do movies, and uh, I, I would love to to talk to him uh, at some point. But uh, but you know, but sorry, Matt, sorry to go on that that little side note there. But um, but so uh, you retired from wrestling in right around like two thousand two thousand three two thousand four, and the reason was was were you just were you just burned out from from pro wrestling, or was this always sort of your plan to sort of you know retire after a few years? I got hurt pretty badly in my final performance. I, I was a death match tournament. Death match is just basically a match that involves weapons or extremely dangerous things in the ring. I did three matches that night um, and and won that tournament, but I, I got hurt very badly in the second round. Um, however, my plan was always to wrestle for maybe one or two years. When I started training, my goal was to go to ECW, the company that we were talking about earlier. Um, but as you mentioned, they went bankrupt in 2001. This was right when I was starting to develop a name for myself. And so I did wrestle for a couple of years um, past that. It was about four and a half years that I, I wrestled, uh, almost five. But no, I, I never I never planned on having a, a long career. And so it was just a matter of picking, picking the right time to leave. Um, and so... So yeah, that was. I actually decided I was going to quit like three months before that performance. That was when I decided that. You, you know, I remember that the the leap, uh, or, or I'm sorry, not the leap, but I remember the the sort of. Uh, I think Zandig gave you the power bomb or uh, or a gorilla press slam off of the ra- of uh, was it Rax Bar and Billiards off of the the roof through uh, I think three tables, and in fact, he you know you didn't even hit a table; you just hit right to the f- concrete. It was it was terrible. I was knocked out cold. I severed an artery in my spine, uh, or not in my spine, but to the side of my back. There was a, there was an artery. I didn't even know I was bleeding that bad, and I I had never been rattled like that in my life. I when I woke up, I I couldn't move any limbs. It, it took me a while to even get any movement back in my limbs, and so uh, and bad concussion um, and probably all sorts of fractured bones from that. I actually uh, didn't go and get X-ray, but. But I, I was I was hurt very badly from that. And, and but then you still went on to wrestle again later that night again against Ian Rotten in the finals. I've told people oftentimes the referee will reach down and like put two fingers in your hand and he'll say, "If you're okay, squeeze my fingers." And I remember it was like right after I got the movement back in my limbs, he did that and I squeezed his fingers. But when I tried to sit up and I could feel how hurt I was, it was it was the first time I ever thought like I shouldn't have squeezed his fingers, like I'm hurt that bad. Um, but the plan was for me to win that match and go on to the finals, and so uh, so I did. But I, I I was in awful shape. So you know, so Matt, so what point did you know after you 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 won the tournament? Did you even think about maybe going to the hospital after that and just saying, you know what, I think I'm just too banged up I, I think we should go to the hospital between matches before I went out for my final match that night I was really out of it I can only remember about half of it I had a terrible concussion but um, when a nurse pulled a piece of glass out of my back I started gushing blood like profusely they couldn't get it to stop they were actually going to call an ambulance they they said call call an ambulance but I still hadn't told hardly anybody 
But because I knew that I wanted to finish my last match and then be done, I said, no, just wrap me up. Let me finish this. Um, I needed to go to the hospital, but I was at that point, I was so done with wrestling just because I was carrying a lot of stress and I was really banged up. I was really beat up. I already had a broken wrist coming into that tournament and I was just fed up with it. And then I got hurt really bad there and I couldn't stand the thought of having to come back and do the finals like, you know, a month later. And so I said, just let me finish this. You know, I'm not sure that was the best decision, but it was, it was what I, what I chose at the time. And and I mean, you know, for for everyone listening to this and they're wondering, like, my God, you know, how, how do you how do you come back from something like that? Just not even not I'm not even talking about professional wrestling, but just in just in general, you, you know, were were you just were your endorphins just so upright at that point where you're just endorphins just sort of taking you over and you were sort of like on autopilot? I I barely was functioning. I can remember bits and pieces. I remember trying to call my final match and I would just have moments where I would drift off and say nothing. And Ian Rotten, who I was going to wrestle, kept saying like, are you sure you can do this? Like, are you sure, are you sure you can do this? And so he had to pretty much just like hand feed me that last match. My head was so scrambled. I was so out of it. So no, it it wasn't even an adrenaline rush. It was more just, I want to get this over and go home and know that it's done, you know? So that, that was the only thing carrying me through. And so so in the aftermath, you know, you you retired uh, from professional wrestling, and you know, I actually ended up uh, a few years ago seeing a documentary you made called Unscarred, uh, the Sick Mondo story, and I wanted to ask about that, you know, because I, I was actually funny because you had a lot of footage on there that I thought was hilarious, you know, like you guys put the toilets up on the on the train tracks and stuff like that, and and, and all that all that crazy. So you know, what inspired you to to, to make that documentary? Uh, you know, chronicling those, those years from, from you as sort of like a teenager all the way into, into wrestling. I was, um, I was dabbling, putting together, it was basically just going to be like sort of a scrapbook um, way of rem- remembering things from my wrestling career. Um, but a company caught wind of it and um, I was offered a deal. It was basically a commission. Um, so I made that thing and sold it for a distribution. Um, so it was during film school. I only had like six weeks to get that thing done. I'd committed to a, a direct TV uh, date. And um, so that was on top of my full load of, uh, you know, college uh, classes. And so um, just rocked that thing out pretty fast, but it was, it was commissioned basically through a friend of mine, through a contact I had. So, and then basically, you know, cause I, I love all the footage. So basically when you were, you were shooting all this stuff, you know, this is back when like mini DV cams or even remember those big VHS tape recorders. So I, I imagine yeah. too, that you, you probably had a lot of those, uh, like a lot of that footage you had to kind of combine together in different formats, like a VHS, uh, you know, mini DV. Uh, it, w- am I right? Yeah. I just about everything I shot was on those small, like high eight, uh, tapes, like those small, uh, Sony or whatever, you know, cassette tapes. I got my hands on one of those cameras, I, I think around age 15. And I mean, it filled up just hours and hours and hours of that stuff. We, we just shot stuff all the time. Yeah. And now, so as we come full circle, you know, the, all the camera stuff now is so is so much lighter and it's a better quality. I mean, hell, I was just playing around the DSLR the other day, and I'm like, my God, <laughs> I remember those big VHS cameras, and I remember playing those back, and you're like, wow, look at this quality of a of a picnic or whatever else. And now you're just like, my God, how the hell did I lug that damn thing around? I still remember first hearing when you were going to be able to record on a digital medium and you know on these little compact flashcards or whatever and i just couldn't fathom it and i couldn't trust it either it's just like yeah right like that it's it's going to be like a hard drive like you bump it and it's going to erase everything and i I was terrified about it first but i can't really think of any mistakes with dslrs just like dumping everything on their own they they seem pretty reliable so it's it's impressive (laughs) really impressive how far the technology has come yeah, it, it's, you know, and, you know, with all the different formats that, you know, we, we've both worked with and with all the different things that are coming out, you know, I, I'm gravitating more and more towards, you know, uh, I used to love physical media. Uh, well, yeah. I still do. I shouldn't say I used to, but like, you know what I mean? But like now it, it's it's so much, you know, stuff to sort of keep tr- track of. And you have, you know, piles of DVDs here and piles of books here. 
And I'm, I'm, I'm in the back of my mind, I'm thinking to myself, someday, am I just going to get rid of all this and have nothing but an entire library on a Kindle and just go from there? You know what I mean? Because you eventually you're like, I don't know, this physical stuff, it's just kind of, sometimes you, you love having it because you can't get, nobody can take it from you because it's not in the cloud. But sometimes you say to yourself, man, it's just, if I wanted to declutter this room, I'd have to get rid of a lot of stuff. It's, I'm, I'm going to be interested to see how that goes because um, I just moved back from Japan and DVD stores are still doing well there, like rental stores. And I love that. And I miss that experience. Um, DVDs, Blu-rays, just walk around, you know, browse, look at, look at covers. And to me, that's a lot better than, you know, hopping on iTunes and scrolling through some things. It's just, it's not the same feeling. And, and I, I don't know if it's, I don't think it's just me being nostalgic. I think it's just makes the experience more relaxing. Like there's only so much time you want to spend staring at a glowing rectangle each day, you know? And so I don't know. I, I also, I just pulled a bunch of books out of storage and sold them. And, and um, while they were like tallying up the price, I was walking around a bookstore um, in the States and, and thinking like, man, this is, I miss this. Like this is, this is a good feeling. And so, I think there's always going to be a contingency of people who are going to hold on to the, the physical medium, but as it gets cheaper and cheaper to make uh, distribute movies, you know, through digital mediums, that it, it, there there is going to be a push and pull, a tug of war going on for sure. Yeah, you know, you you moved to Japan. You know, I wanted to ask about that too because I, you know, when we we reconnected, I saw you were living in Japan. And I'm thinking to myself, my God, I go, this, this, you know, to, to sort of just pick up and move to Japan, uh, it, it's just, it's, 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 it's something off the beaten path. I mean, I love Japan, but I hear, always hear two things from everybody about going to Japan. I hear these two things. They love it, but my God, is it expensive. Is that true? Is that true, Matt? It's very true, and especially any, any kind of travel in Japan, like, I will never complain about tolls in the U.S. again. Like when you're driving, you can you can get on the highway and drive for like three hours, something like that, and get off. And depending on where you are, like going from uh, like Tokyo south to Chiba, get off and, and pay thirty-five to forty dollars in tolls. Like I've, I've experienced this. Or you make a wrong turn in Tokyo and you just take a, a loop in like a spaghetti bowl, you know, exit you have to pay five bucks just for going through that loop and then you get back on, then you have to pay it again. Like it's, it's, it's just horrendous, but it's very expensive. But if you can, uh, if you can find a way to swing it, um, it's very, very reliable transportation, like the trains and the buses, it's just remarkable how on time they are. Um, but, uh, every, every country, every place you're going to live is going to have its ups and downs. But I, I, I had a wonderful time in, in Japan, in Tokyo. You know what's funny? I have a friend of mine who just moved to Moldova, and Moldova is this weird. Well, I shouldn't say weird country. It's a it's a country. It's a smaller country in in, in Eastern Europe, um, and he just moved there from Canada, and he absolutely loves it. And he goes because he, he his money goes further there. He talks about all the stuff that they have. The internet's faster than where he was in Canada and everything else, and. Um, But I always just think, go back to that, where it's, you know, and I have a friend of mine who moved to Latvia, but then I always think about, you know, my friends who've actually, like like yourself, who've gone to Japan, and it's the exact opposite. They're like, you know, yeah, we love the culture, we love love the the media, and how crazy Japan is, but they're like, my God, they were like, it's so expensive here. And uh, I had a friend of mine who went there, and he said, you must have to be a multimillionaire to live in Tokyo, because he said everything is just so priced so high. And he goes, I, he goes, I don't know how people do it over there. It's, I had a blast. You know, I, I had so many experiences in film over there, um, so many random jobs, you know, operating cameras. I got to operate the red, like a full-on, like, steady cam. Uh, you know, worked as, as uh, a gaffer, directing tons of editing. I got to work behind or in front of the camera. I learned that if you, if you're basically a Caucasian or even a Westerner, um, somebody not from Japan, you have a visa, a work visa and a flexible schedule. You're an actor, you're a model. It's that simple. (laughs) I'm not even kidding. Like I, one day I was, I was looking through the modeling, uh, websites, like the agencies. And I, I, I just like, you know, rubbing my eyes and looking again. And I sat back 
And uh, I read an article on how easy it is to get into it. And I just said, that's it. I'm an actor. And, you know, fast forward a few years, I've, I've been in all sorts of movies, TV commercials, shows. Um, I mean, like big roles, small roles, everything. It's like I so got over my fear of being on camera. First, I'd be all nervous, but then I was just like, this is so easy. And, and honestly, the quality is not usually on par with what we uh, would do in the U.S., so if, if you want to practice getting comfortable on camera, Japan is a fantastic place to do that. Wild, a lot of fun. But yeah, the thing is that, that I got fed up with those, the film industry pays horribly and they do not treat talent well at all. There are not unions. Uh, there are no unions. There's no protection for most talent. And so the low pay and the abuse you have to sustain is just like unfathomable. Um, so I, I had a blast for a while, but as I speak to you right now, I'm driving to LA um, from Phoenix because I'm like, this was fun, but I, I, I got to make some money doing this. You know, I, I got to get in a place where people have money and real things are happening. And uh, so that you move back to America now and, and now are, are you moving full time back to LA? That's the plan. Yeah. Um, I, I have a place I could uh, crash um, I've got a buddy I'm going to uh, live with for a few months, but um, there's a huge, huge convention I'm atten attending this weekend, uh, which it's called Pitch Fest, um, or they call it Script Fest. Um, but yeah, Great American uh, Pitch Fest. If I lose you, let me know. I'm driving through a, a, a little valley right here. But oh. yeah, but basically. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was saying if I lose you, I'll just call, I'll just call you right back. But, uh, but you know, it's funny. It's funny, Matt. I, I, and, and I'm sorry to also uh, to interrupt you. Uh, I actually applied to Pitch Fest years ago because they were looking for a head of media. And I actually applied and I was I was like a finalist for the position, but I didn't get it. And uh, it's just, it's just funny that you're actually going to that. It just uh, I actually know the two people, um, but Bob and uh, and I think it's Sini or Sunai, whatever her name is. Uh, I, I actually know those two people who actually run that. That's 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 outstanding, man. That would have been a great gig. And you know what? I was reading through the the guest list or, or list of companies and um, agencies that are going to be there, and I saw. Um, let me see. Yeah, Whitney Whitney Davis. She's got her own literary agency, but you interviewed her episode 132 but that that was one of the one of the best episodes i think i've listened to of your podcast she she gave all sorts of insight on what it takes to get representation as a writer and to work in la but yeah she's she's going to be there so i'm going to try and uh bring some projects and pitch and see i'm not sure if it's a good great fit for what she does but i i just thought she was really encouraging and so uh, i'm excited you know it's funny matt Everybody who listens to my podcast, and I've said this before, will always mention Whitney Davis is one of her favorite episodes. One of their favorite episodes, they'll always say, "Oh, I was listening to your podcast, and I saw I was I listened to the one with whatever. Oh, but the one with Whitney Davis was awesome." And I said, <laughs> I told her, I said, "Everyone compliments you, Whitney." I said, "You got to come back on and talk about networking." Uh, but yeah, yeah, I, honestly, she she is. Uh, a phenomenal man, and I, honestly, Matt, if you could uh, get a chance to even grab coffee with her, I would really, really encourage it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna totally uh, name drop Dave Bullis when I meet her, and um, I was excited because on on the episode, it sounded like she mostly represents novelists, but reading up on what she's doing right now, she's representing quite a few screenwriters, and she's she's getting people work in TV and film, and so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to meet her. Yeah, yeah, she, she's uh, actually doing a lot of this more screenwriting stuff now. And uh, she went to Dallas and did a whole screenwriting seminar there. And then she's going now, she's, you know, obviously living living in L.A. now. Um, oh, wait, no, I'm sorry, she goes back and forth between L.A. and Texas. That That's what she does, yeah. Because I, I think she, she said to me she likes L.A., but her husband, uh, and they want, they want to stick close to Texas. But, but, yeah, if you get a chance to even have coffee with her, honestly – Huge, huge recommendation to do so. Uh, so you know, and, and we're talking about Pitch Fest. You know, do, so do, are are you focusing a lot, a lot too, Matt, on on writing scripts now? Yeah, I have three three scripts that I'm bringing to Pitch Fest that vary quite a bit. And so I was just given the executive directory, and it's really helpful. It it tells exactly what these companies are looking for how to pitch to them, how not to pitch to them, what the budget is, what genre they want. And so, um, 
yeah, writing and directing is still my primary goal. Uh, but you know, I have a couple demo reels in order. Um, this is, they're mostly looking for writers at, at pitch fest, but these are production companies looking for scripts for, you know, material they want to produce, whether it's for a TV pilot or TV series or a film. And so they, uh, most of these companies employ directors as well. So I'm, I'm just going to see what I can, what I can do, what I can pull off here. And, and also one of the things you're going to be talking about too, Matt is the trade, right? So uh, the trade, which just had its, its premiere, uh, I'm sorry. It, well, if you want to call it the premiere, I, I don't know what, 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 how you would want to phrase that, Matt. But but you know, the the, the trade is the movie that you've just shot recently. Uh, you know, and, and that's obviously something that you're going to be obviously using as a discussion point. So if you could, Matt, could you talk about you know to, to talk about the trade and uh, what the film is uh, for every, for all the listeners out there? Sure, I'll try and tell you in a nutshell. Um... So I was in Tokyo um, for five and a half years, if you can believe it, uh, working in the film industry. There were a couple feature-length films that I tried to get off the ground uh, with people there. Didn't happen for various reasons, uh, but I just I want to make features. It's what I want to do. And so it's good to always, I, I believe, just stop and say, what do I have right now or what story can I tell right now? And I did not intend on telling a story related to my wrestling career But um, while I was in Japan, there was a younger guy who mimicked, who was mimicking my wrestling career. He's 10 years younger than me. He was a a diehard fan. My wrestling name is Nick Mondo, or Sick Nick Mondo. And he used to come to the shows uh, with signs saying uh, Little Mondo. And he dressed like me, just this skinny little kid. Five years after I quit, um, he got into wrestling i didn't know he was going to do this i knew he was training but he debuted as little mondo but put on you know 50 pounds of muscle put on some weight and was basically reenacting my character i was okay with that until he started reenacting all of the violent stuff that i did getting hurt severely and in sort of an agreement with him uh, making a deal with him i said I'll, I'll i'll make an appearance in one of your matches if he, he was going to carry on a very, very dangerous stunt that had to be concerned. And we, we made a bargain. He decided not to go through with it if I would show up in one of his matches. I did. Um, this was in 2013, uh, December of 2013. It ended up being a pretty emotional moment um, in the ring. It went over really well. Um, he retired that character on the spot. And um, anyway, it, it shook loose all sorts of ideas. Meanwhile, I'm trying to figure out what kind of a film can I make right now. So I had the idea for a wacky docudrama, half scripted, half uh, documentary, basically detailing how and why I got into this violent wrestling business and why I left so abruptly. And so that's the trade. Um, It premiered in London. Uh, It screened in Tokyo. And just this past week, um, my sales reps did a special VIP screening in New York City. Uh, for distributors and for press. Um, so that is a film that I'm pushing for sale right now. Well, my, my reps have taken care of that, which is which is a relief. Uh, but that's one thing I'm hoping I can use for some momentum. Um, it's half scripted, like I said, but that's my intention is to get into narrative film rather than documentary. Um, so I'm, I'm really reaching for, for narrative uh, film right now. So, so Matt, I wanted to ask you, know, what, what was that? Well, by the way, I remember Little Mondo coming to these shows too. I remember him being in the crowd, and his, and you know him dressing as you, and and uh, his his he would come with his dad. And then when I saw probably a few years ago, I did see that that there was actually he actually started wrestling and doing all that stuff. So, what, what was the one st- what, what stunt was it that he was going to reenact of yours that that you finally had to step in and say no? Well. These deathmatch tournaments that I mentioned um, a year prior to my retirement, I was in a deathmatch tournament. I made it to the final round, and I finally lost in the finals by um, it was a 200 light tube, barbed wire, and salt deathmatch. So probably don't need to paint too much more of a picture for you. It was it was nasty. It was bloody. Uh, needed stitches afterwards, but I I lost the match by having. Um, one person hold my arms and the other one fire up a weed whacker 
and hit me in the stomach with it. So it's, it's, it's unbelievably insane. I, I, once, once, once you step away from that whole scene, it's like, what on earth was I thinking? But in that world that it kind of fits in with the, with the aesthetic, with what's going on. And so it became kind of infamous. Um, it got a lot of circulation. And so Rory, that's his real name, Rory Little Mondo was planning a stunt where um, they were going to destroy him in the ring. And then he was going to get hit in the stomach twice with the weed whacker. And I just told him this really disturbs me. I was like, I, I knew you when you didn't even weigh a hundred pounds. I just, I have a problem with you maiming yourself, like trying to honor me. I'm like, this is not what I want you to do. You know, like, so that, that was, that was what he was planning on doing that. I, I finally made a bargain with it to not do it. You know, again, Matt, you know, it's funny. I was actually at tournament death one where that happened. I actually have to find it, but I have a photo of you taking homeless Jimmy uh, off the top of that rider truck through that light tube covered table. No kidding. You were there. Yep. I was there. I remember you cause you fought wife beater in the finals. And I remember that, um, that was actually funny enough. That was actually, I think my final CCW show or, or close to it. I can't remember after, uh, no, no, it wasn't my final one. Uh, my final one was one of the cages of death. That was my final, uh, actually that was like one of my final wrestling shows ever. Uh, I've only been to like two or three after that. Uh, one was when hot, when Hulk Hogan came to Philly, but that's a whole nother story. But yeah, I was actually there, uh, Matt. And I was, I was actually right there when you put homeless Jimmy through that, uh, glass, uh, the light tube covered table. Oh man, that's, that's fun to know that. <laughs> yeah. See, we, we, we've been running into each other here <laughs> all these years. And now we finally, finally get to, uh, have this conversation. And, and, I'm so, amazed. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Seriously, it's a small world, right? Uh, I have to find yeah. that that photo though, and um, but yeah, but you know, it, it's so as we talk about the trade, it, it, and it's it had its premiere in London, and you know, it's premiered and, and it's premiered in Tokyo, and also there was that press screening in in, uh, in New York a few days ago. What are some of the uh, of the of the plans for the trade? I, I mean, are, are you hoping to sort of, uh, you know, I mean, is it is it like you do you have like a personal goal for it, like to get it on Netflix? Um, I, I would say getting in block get it in Blockbuster, but there's not really too many Blockbusters around anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I I just I hope to I hope to get this thing. Obviously, a really good distribution deal in North America. Um, Wrestling fans in general are collectors, you know this, and so I want to get a really good DVD Blu-ray package going. I, I already have a bunch of bonus features that I can include. I hope for Mexico, I hope for the UK, hope for Germany, um, maybe Japan. Distribution in Japan is really tough, but um, I know there's some Southeast Asia potential, actually, maybe China. Um I don't know if this is possible, but, but my reps are going to try and set up some sort of a, a limited, maybe East Coast theatrical run, just like art house theaters, and maybe do a few meet and greet type screenings. Uh, but it uh, would be great, you know. I, I hope to turn this thing into a, a profitable venture. I've invested a lot into it. So uh, I, I just want it to be a really good step to another project. That's, that's my ultimate goal and something that people can readily have available uh, if they're interested, you know, I think that meet and greet is a great idea, especially if you do that in like these really uh, wrestling friendly towns like Philly, New York, Boston, or places like that. And especially the meet and greet, you know, it's kind of like what Kevin Smith did with uh, Red State, where he just basically took it on the road. And it became like the old the old way that people people used to show films, which was they would take their film reels and they would go to town to town to town and say, you know, tonight tonight is your chance to see the Wizard of Oz or Gone with the Wind or, or whatever. And then, you know, they'd go on to the next town the next day. And I, I think that it, it, for indie filmmakers is really important because you have to you know stand out from the pack. And I, I, you know, as sort of, as, as sort of, as, yeah, if I could talk, <laughs> as, as these big, um, uh, you know, uh, film studios, they're always wondering how they can sort of, you know, upcharge the ticket and, and still keep sales at a, at a particular level. And they always try to package things like you'll get a digital download, you'll maybe get a shirt, you may get something else. And 
I, I think the biggest thing was, remember World War Z when that came out? Brad Pitt was making all those surprise appearances everywhere, and all of a sudden, yeah. t- ticket sales started going up for the thing because everyone's like, "Oh my God, is Brad Pitt going to show up here and and talk to us?" Could you know what I mean? So, I I really think being able to meet the filmmaker at, a, a, is critical. And by the way, Matt, I'm sure as you know this, you'll know who's a filmmaker in the crowd because after they see the movie, the number one question they're going to ask you is. What'd you shoot that on? <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's a good point. The, the two screenings that we uh, that I attended so far, so much fun, and the Q and A's that we did afterwards. So I'm completely on board. Um, I was actually working on setting up a co promotion uh, with a wrestling company on the East Coast, like a, a screening the night before a big wrestling show. But my reps actually said, "Hold off on that because if we give this." opportunity to the distributors we think that could be really appealing to them especially if they already have the dvds blu-rays printed and can sell them at these events and so i said all right it's in your hands but um but by the way how's that going i know you were going to try and uh chase down kevin smith for an interview any any uh possibility on that um it's kind of like stalled out um it, it, it was. I thought we were going somewhere with it, and it just kind of petered out. Uh, I really have to start stalking him again, and just being like, "Come on, the show, man." Um, but uh, but but all kidding aside, it did really peter out. And when uh when he when he has maybe when he when he's going to to promote red uh not red uh moose jaws, then uh, I'll probably start talking to him again and see maybe if I can get him on the show. Yeah, I, I'm sure a lot of people would be interested. In- I, I, I said Richard Kelly too. I'd love to hear what he's up to. The director of Donnie Darko, you know what what he has to say. But, but yeah, yeah, you're doing great with your podcast, man. Oh, oh, well, thank you, man. I, I really appreciate that, man. I I try my best. Sometimes I I stumble and stammer because I want to say like five things at one time. But uh, but other than that, you know, I I I've got a pretty good guest list. Uh, you know, it, it's it's just funny because one of the things that I I am pretty strong at is networking. Uh, I've j- mm-hmm. it's just a skill that comes natural to me. So like doing this podcast, people are like, how the hell did you get this guy on here? And I go, I have no idea. Cause when I had Kazzy and Ovis on here who did Dallas buyers club and a bunch of other like really cool movies. And like, you know, he's, he's an A-level producer and I, and they're like, how the hell did you get him to agree to do your podcast? And I go, I have no idea. I, I just, it was, it just kind of, you know, it happened. And it's just, you know, one of those things. And, and that's how it happened. You know, it just, I've just been very good at networking. And that's how I sort of been able to get all these awesome people like yourself, man, on the podcast. Thank you. And, and uh, I was going to say, I, I uh, episode 148 and 149, I highly recommend. 148 was Michael G. Kehoe. How do you say his name? Mm-hmm. That's it. Michael uh, G. Kehoe. Yeah, from he he directed Alice the Hatred, but um, and then 149 Dan Mervish, the director of the Slam Dance Festival. If you want to hear a lot of amazing stories and learn a lot about people who are getting things done, getting films done, and moving things in the industry, like that, I love those two episodes. They're both fantastic. Yeah, and and Dan Mervish, everyone was always asking when his when his episode came out, people were like, "Wait a minute, they were like, did you have an axe murderer or something on your podcast?" I said, "No, <laughs> no, no, he worked with an axe murderer, guys. Come on, get it right." Uh, but that uh, was a that was a fascinating story, even involving uh, Johnny Depp at one point. So yeah, <laughs> I love that story. So bizarre. <laughs> yeah, seriously, how Johnny Depp got ended up being connected to this axe murderer from from uh, <laughs> from this college. It's like what the hell? It's a it's such a weird weird story, but it's all true. And because uh, I looked up the story after the podcast, and I was like, holy crap! I was like, this is this is this is a one hundred percent real 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 true story, you know? And it's just it's unbelievable. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> But, but I've been, again, I've been very fortunate to have a lot of really cool people on the podcast. Again, like yourself, Matt, and uh, you know, as we were talking about everything, you know, from pro wrestling to filmmaking to to your latest film, The Trade, and you're going to Pitch Fest, uh, which I wish you the best of luck. So, I mean, we've been talking for roughly about an hour, maybe hour and ten minutes. So, you know, just in closing, Matt, is there anything that we get a chance to talk about that maybe you want to talk about right now, or just any sort of parting thoughts that you'd like to say to put a period to the end of this whole conversation? <laughs> Well, I just, I, I think there's a, a tremendous film education coming through here on your podcast. So I want to, I want to thank you for that. Um, you know, I'm like you and a, a lot of people um, on your podcast. I mean, you, you get some really high profile people, but we're all just trying to figure out this 
this film industry thing and crack the code. But, but, uh, you know, um, yeah, I'm in a season of transition right now, so I don't know exactly what's next, but I'm, I'm going to try my hand at LA and, you know, see how it goes. But, but, uh, um, you know, thank you for helping me promote the trade and, and what I'm doing. And, um, you know, yeah, I just, I look forward to keeping in touch with you and I, I definitely will. Yeah. And, and please do Matt. And, uh, you know, I'm going to make sure I, I by the way, I, I was going to ask about your social media and I know you're not on like Twitter or anything like that. I wanted to just to say really quickly, uh, to Matt, do you know that there's a person out there that actually has a Twitter account that's pretending to be you and they're tweeting at other wrestlers that are obviously fake accounts. So like, Nick Mondo, like they have a Nick Mondo account that's called, you know, Unscarred Mondo, and he's tweeting at some guy who's supposed to be CM Punk, and they're going back and forth with each other. But it's just like, I don't know why they would do- be doing this, but uh, it, it just, I got a laugh out of that because I actually was going to tweet at you one time, and I saw, I saw that account. I'm like, wait, that's not, that's not mad. What the hell is that? I think I need to get a Twitter account going. This has happened before. I've had to shut people down. I've gotten notifications. Last year, two people I had to shut down on Twitter. It's happened on Facebook. Right now, since I moved back to the States, um, I got a new iPhone. I was traveling, and I got blocked out of my Facebook account. And I currently am, and that's where I promote everything. But I think I need to get on either Twitter or Instagram or both. But, like, I'm not letting go of this account thing yet like I'm, I'm gonna see what needs to happen to get it back but like i've tried everything right now but but that's the bizarre world, world of social media this has happened to me at least at least 10 times over the years where i have to go and shut down somebody who's pretending to be me which which i don't understand why somebody would want to do that but yeah thanks for letting me know i'm gonna have to look at twitter again it sounds like I'm I'm sorry, Matt, to be bearing bad, bad news like that. I'm sorry, because um, I, I saw that and I was like, "Whoa, Mondo!" I was like, "Wait, that's not him." Because, uh, but uh, but you know what? I'll, but but honestly, Matt, if you ever uh, if you ever do get a, t- a Twitter or Instagram, I'm on both, and I'd be glad to give you some shout outs and stuff like that. And I'll even you know uh, I'll, I'll uh, encourage everyone to follow you, and because I, I honestly. And you're you're such an interesting guy, and I'm so glad we could actually like uh, finally do this interview and finally meet up and and share all these stories about pro wrestling and everything else. And uh, it, it's just been a very fun trip down memory lane. And um, if if I could, Max, I, I know you have to run. I know you're. I, I know you got uh, like ten thousand things going on. I remember one time we went to I, I, a group of uh, friends and I went to CZW, and this is again at Champ Soccer Arena in Seoul, New Jersey, and this this very like. Uh, prissy, um, very, very like, you know, uppity girl went with us who was a girlfriend of this guy. And she, she goes, she, she sits down and she goes, I feel like I'm going to be stabbed at any moment in this place. <laughs> and I said, Yeah, there's a good chance. <laughs> it was just, and everyone around, like, everyone around laughed because they could just see that this girl was so out of her element. And it was just, <laughs> It was just a funny, a funny uh, uh, little anecdote. But 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 it's been so fun talking to you, Matt. Uh, you know, going down memory lane. Um, is there any links that you like to send anybody to? Like, do you have an official website you like to send everyone to? I'll just I'll give you the links to the two trailers for my film. The other one we just we just launched, and so that that's what I'd like to spread the word on right now. And um, I like I say, I think very shortly I'm just going to have to hop on Twitter and Instagram and and hopefully get this Facebook thing resolved. But but yeah, thank you so much. Um, and I was just going to say like most people I either separate, um, or need to separate if I'm doing these interviews into either the wrestling half or the film half. And so that's pretty unique getting to talk to you and mix both. And I, I, I think that's, that's really cool. Just, the the common trajectory, if you will, you know, that we've been on. So yeah, let's, let's do it again, man. Yeah, and there is a lot of storytelling involved in professional wrestling, and I, I, I you know, and I know, I mean, I, I, I haven't watched wrestling in years, but, but I know there is a storytelling aspect that you know, I, I feel is lost in current day wrestling. But that's a whole other story, Matt. Uh, you know, I would love to have you back on uh, anytime you like to come back on. You want to talk about even your experience at Pitch Fest or anything you like to talk about. You know, always feel free. Everyone listening, it's DaveBullis dot com. Twitter, it's at Dave underscore Bullis. And uh, I want to say thank you, everybody, for listening. And thank you, Matt, for coming on, my friend. Dave, thank you. I will be listening in the future. I'm a fan. 
hey, I, I appreciate it, my friend. And uh, I, we're, we're, our paths are going to cross again because they always seem to, right? Hopefully not in a wrestling ring, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> that That's where this is all going to end. It, in somebody's backyard, you know? <laughs> exactly. It can't be like at WrestleMania in a cage, like Bundy and Hogan. <laughs> it's got to be It's got to be in the backyard, in the middle of nowhere, in Birdsboro, you versus me, on like a film camera on a pole match. I'm going to be Ping Pong Mondo. <laughs> Next person that calls me Ping Pong is out the street. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. It, it, I tell you, it, it's it's it. Bundy is a is a hell of a hell of a hell of a, hell of a guy. It's just the funny stories about him, man. Um, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Big Bob Mondo. Uh, so, Matt, again, best of luck in Pitch Fest. Best of luck in LA, dude. And I'll talk to you very soon. Peace, buddy. Thanks again. I'll talk to you soon. Find Dave at DaveBullist dot com. Please make sure to subscribe and share the podcast.